Um, we uh, do have an update that I don't think is on your uh, prayer list. Um, well, yeah, it is here, but uh, Beth Larson had uh, gallbladder surgery on Monday, been in a lot of pain yesterday and today, and actually was readmitted into the hospital last night. So if you'd please remember uh, Beth, especially in your prayers tonight. And then when uh, I get done with the presentation, or if I have to cut it short because I didn't get through, uh, there's a few things that uh, I've asked, uh, again, Brother Ted to, to pray for uh, before we break into prayer groups, pray for our country, uh, pray that those on active duty and in the reserves, that they might hear the word of God and that they might believe. Pray especially for the Bible-believing chaplains that we have in our military, that they might be and have the ability to proclaim the word of God freely. And also pray for those in harm's way that are on the field uh, for protection. And, uh, you know, uh, I've never been in combat, but I've been around people who have. I've been around a lot of people who have. And uh, I know Ted could do an excellent job in explaining this, but uh, there's a, there's, there is definitely a feeling that comes over. The adrenaline uh, flows. And if you haven't looked at uh, these three medals on this side of the uh, podium or whatever here, uh, please come up and look at them. We have a Navy Commendation Medal with a V. What does that V stand for? Valor. Valor. We have a Bronze Star for operations in combat. And we have, I think, one of the prettiest medals that there is in the armed forces, a Purple Heart. What does a Purple Heart mean? Now, you don't say anything. I want to see what other people, you, you're, you're steeped in military, Richard, so let's, let's see if somebody else, what does Purple Heart stand for? Pardon? Somebody was wounded. They were wounded uh, in battle. So these, these are really three very, very distinguished uh, medals that have been awarded. So I'm going to ask you a question. When did care for veterans start in America? Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. Goes back even further than that. It goes back to 1636 with the Puritans. And here's, uh, here's what it says. Uh, the roots of taking care of our veterans can be traced back to 1836 when the pilgrims of Plymouth Colony were at war with the Indians the Pilgrims passed a law that stated that disabled soldiers would be supported by the colony. So 1636 is the first recognition of veterans that were wounded or were disabled. Now, we can come through the ages. None of those answers that you gave were entirely wrong because it seemed like after every war, and it even applies today, after every war there was more concern for those individuals who were wounded or who were disabled uh, in action. So uh, obviously we have World War I, which is the start of Veterans Day. November 11th, the 11th hour, the 11th day of November. That ceasefire was recognized not until 1930 when Armistice Day was proclaimed a national holiday. After, and, and certain veterans benefits, the, the, the veterans hospitals were created, the uh, states had a number of veterans homes that were created. I know the state that uh, I served in for a number of years in Ohio, there was the Ohio Veterans Home. Uh, I think we have a veterans home here in Florida, although I'm not completely sure, but I think we do. And that really started after 
World War I. Then we come up to World War II. A number of our soldiers were sent into battle in World War II. And in order to take care of them, there was a bill that was passed. What was the name of that bill? Yep, the GI Bill. The GI Bill was passed, which provided a number of things for veterans. The, what was the biggest impact of that bill? Education. Education. The bill created funds for individuals to go to college and get a four-year degree. And that has even uh, expanded where today, now if, it's, if it doesn't get cut out in the next budget, but where today, those who have GI Bill benefits can transfer those benefits to a spouse or to a family member. So uh, the, the GI Bill has, uh, has progressed uh, over the years. Um, you know, all of these wars, it seems like uh, the veterans' benefits have increased. The Civil War, the Indian Wars, the Spanish-American War, the Mexican Border Wars. Uh, all of those wars were then subsequently recognized as at least a minor increase to uh, veterans. So, uh, you know, another interesting thing, um, in 1938 was actually the day that uh, uh, it was really recognized in the United States. But uh, something else happened in 1938 that would lead to World War II. The invasion of Poland? Not yet. Almost. Who took power in Germany? Adolf Hitler. And that then started the process to lead to World War II. And it was just kind of a coincidence that that happened the same year that Armistice Day was recognized as a national holiday. Uh, that was broadened to Veterans Day in uh, 1954, and uh, obviously we had one more World War. Uh, we, have had, we had the Korean War, and we were in the midst of the Cold War, soon to be followed by Vietnam. And at that time, it was thought more appropriate to recognize those who served and those who would serve. Since Vietnam, we've been engaged in many different conflicts. Uh, I was actually called back to active duty uh, during the Kosovo situation. We've had the Bosnia-Herzegovina uh, period, Iraq, Afghanistan, the war on terror. Um, but what do we do today? We, we celebrate today. This is Veterans Day. It's the reason why I wore the uniform today. It's, it's Veterans Day. I'm, I'm down to the point where I wear it about once a year because it just seems that, you know, because of the heat in my closet that every year that I pull it out, it shrinks a little bit, okay? Uh, I've still got some room, but not near as much as what I had uh, a, a number of years ago. So anyhow, are you a veteran? I dare say that anybody in this room who has accepted Christ as their savior is a veteran of the war. And let's look at a couple of passages of scripture. I want to look at uh, Romans, uh, I think it's 8, 23, that says we are in a battle. And here's what it says. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for adoption of our sons. Obviously, that's not the right uh, 23, not 26. 
sorry. Well, I got the wrong reference there, but uh, anyhow, you get the idea. Uh, Romans says we're in a battle. How do we win the victory? Do we ever get out of this battle? Okay. Let's look at, uh, let's look at James chapter 4, uh, verse 1. And uh, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasure that wage war in your members? We actually wage war, the Bible tells us, within ourselves. And how do we win that war? Well, let's uh, look at 1 John uh, 5, 1. And if you look at, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever Whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and we do what? Obey, observe his commands. That's how we're going to win this war within ourselves. So I dare say this evening that all of us are veterans. Uh, in Romans, we see the verse where soldiers put on armor. We see that in Romans. We see that in Ephesians. So just what is a veteran? Well, as I said before, Ted gave a very good explanation. I'm not going to go there because uh, time is fleeting, but there are differences in definitions. The one I like is one, and, and as I go through, and here's what I'd like you to think. Now, in my classes that I taught at Clearwater Christian College, this is always a problem that I had. How do you get students to think? Okay? So I want you to think a little bit, and what I want you to do is apply what I'm saying about a military veteran, or I should say a veteran of the U.S. Armed Forces, to you as a soldier and as a veteran in the battle with Jesus Christ as our commander. So, um, well, what does he say? The Secretary of Veterans Affairs said in part, they are men and women who for many reasons donned the uniform of our country to stand between freedom and tyranny, to take up the sword of justice in defense of the liberties we hold dear. Do we hold dear the liberties that we have in Christ? We certainly ought to. But as much as they differ by gender, race, age, national origin, or profession, they share a common love for our great nation. Do we all share a common love for our great God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Soldiers love enough to put their very lives on the line, if need be, to guarantee the way of life we enjoy today and to secure that way of life for tomorrow's generations. End of quote. Well, in earlier days of our country, the definition would have only included those who have served during wartime. And the definition, as I mentioned Sunday, still does not include those who have served only in the reserves. Today, there are approximately 25 million living American veterans, which is less than 10% of the U.S. population, one of the lowest percentages that it's practically ever been. Uh, and this includes those like myself who have served during one, have more than one period of hostility. Uh, altogether, almost 30% of the nation's population, about 70 million persons, are potentially eligible for Veterans Administration benefits. Now, that number includes veterans, dependents of veterans, survivors of deceased uh, veterans. So, my question to you is, what are we working against? What percentage of the population of our country is a veteran in the service of God? 
And if we, we don't know that, but there are studies out there, but you can look around your neighborhood. What percentage of the people that live around you are Christians? Where is your battlefield? Now, a very, very famous soldier, don't say it, <laughs> said these words, duty, honor, country. Some of you ought to know that. Who said those words? Huh? No. Now, here's a guy who was living in Mexico at the time and knows the answer. <laughs> okay. It was, it was General of the Army, Douglas MacArthur. Okay. And now you can answer, Richard. Do you know where he gave and uttered those famous words? No. No. His farewell address to the nation at West Point. Okay? And uh, so as far as the military man or woman is concerned and a soldier of the cross is concerned, those three words stand for what you ought to be, what you can be, and what you will be. General of the Army Douglas MacArthur in his farewell speech to the cadets at West Point, he went on to say that they are your rallying points to build courage when courage seems to fail, to regain faith when there seems to be little cause for faith, to create hope when hope becomes forlorn. Can you see how each of that can apply to us as soldiers of the cross? They build your basic character. They mold you for future roles as custodians of the national defense. What are we custodians of? The word of Christ, the gospel. Okay? Uh, they teach you, this is MacArthur, okay? I'm, I'm kind of interdispersing, inter interspersing here, but they teach you to be proud and unbending and honest failure. Do we fail? Yeah. We all do. But humble and gentle in success, not to substitute words for action, nor to seek the path of comfort, but to face the stress and spear of difficulty and challenge, to master yourself before you seek to master others. He went on with so many other contrasts, but he did not attempt to really define the words duty on our country. And if he had had more time, I'm sure that he would have had the most difficulty with the word country. Now, if you are a member of a country, typically you are also a what? Citizen, right? So you're a citizen. You're a citizen of the United States. Are you a citizen anywhere else? Pardon? Yeah, those who know Christ are. We are citizens with God in glory. There's no question. The Bible tells us that we are citizens. Now, I'm going to get to another thing in, in a minute. Um, so the dictionary defines country as a political state or nation, the land of a person's birth, origin, or citizenship. Now, where is your citizenship? And again, we can go back to uh, the Bible, and we can look at uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 3, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 19. And in Ephesians 2, 19, it says, So then, ye are no longer strangers, but aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. So a very clear definition in the word of God to those of us who know Christ, where our citizenship is. Now, most of us then have dual citizenship. We have citizenship in America, and we have citizenship in glory. Uh, now, there's another terminology that's used, 
But if you are an ambassador, as the Bible says that we are, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, if you are an ambassador, generally speaking, and I've never heard of one that isn't, but if you're an ambassador, what do you have to be in that country? You have to be a citizen, generally speaking. I, I've never heard of an ambassador that hasn't been a citizen of the company, country rather, that he's been sent to represent. Well, if you're an ambassador, that's further proof that you are a citizen of heaven. And the Bible clearly says that we are ambassadors. So, in the sense we use the word country, and I'm kind of back now to the veterans, and that's what I say, I'm going to be jumping around a little bit. But if we use the word country in combination with duty and honor, it means much more than just those definitional words. Country is something that we should be proud of. Now, uh, I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time in this, but, but God has really blessed. I've, God has sent me to a number of different countries. Those of you who know a little bit about me, uh, I spent almost five years in Japan. I've been to England. I've lived in Detroit. So I've been to Canada. <laughs> Not a very big trip, but I've been to Canada. I've been to Mexico. I've been to England. I've been to Germany. I've been to Denmark. I've been to Hungary and uh, Korea and the Philippines and China. And I'll tell you what, every time I've been away from my home, I was really glad to get back. Because whatever the problems that we have in our country, in my opinion, there's no better place to be. We have the highest standard of living of anybody in the world. You go to even a country like England, our standard of living is much higher than the average English person. And that's probably the next most highest that I've been in, although I could argue uh, Germany now. But uh, still, I'm proud to be an American. The question I ask you is, are you proud to be a Christian? So, where is your country? Where is your loyalty? Now, in America, our freedom is restricted by what's the ultimate law of the land in America? I get you a little bit of a civics lesson. The Constitution is the highest law of the land. Um, so, you know, I still have an adequately divine, defined country, but I think you're still getting the picture. Um, and hopefully by the time I'm through with duty and honor, I hope you'll have a better picture of how they stand together, duty, honor, country, and also its application to us as citizens of the kingdom and followers of Christ. Well, duty says, the, the dictionary says, it's an obligatory task, a conduct, a service, or function that arrives from one's position in life. What is our duty because of our position in life as a Christian? We could spend the rest of the night till midnight and probably go over what duties we have that are given to us in the New Testament. But I just want you to think about that. What are your duties as a Christian? Uh, all right, let's take a look at honor. Definition. Good name or public esteem. Reputation. One whose worth brings respect. A keen sense of ethical conduct. One's word given as a guarantee of performance. Well, applying that to us as Christians, and we can even go back to the Old Testament, and, and I'm not one that advocates bringing the New Old Testament law into our lives today, but we 
can use the Old Testament as an example and as a guidance. And there's one particular verse in the Old Testament that I'm, I'm thinking of right now that has to do with one's word given as a guarantee of performance. Anybody? When you vow a vow, be careful that you make good. I'm paraphrasing, of course. But say that so louder, Billy, Jimmy, so everybody can hear it. It's better. It is better to never make a vow than to make a vow to break it. That, exactly. It's better not to, to, to make a vow than to make a vow and then break it. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Ethical conduct. One's word given as a guarantee of performance. Now, applying those definitions of duty, honor, country to a military person, I don't think it takes much sense or much more to really figure out how hundreds and thousands of our federal, federal uh, fellow countrymen and women have given their lives in the protection of our country and in the preservation of freedom around the world. If we have Christians that have given their lives for the protection of freedom of proclaiming Jesus Christ? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we could again go through numerous, numerous examples. Uh, again, Brother Ted talked about, uh, uh, is it Nick Saint? Was it Nick Saint? Nick Saint. Nate. Nate, Nate Saint and his four friends who were murdered on the banks of the, of the river. There's no question that people have been killed for their faith. There's no question that men and women have been killed for their duty to serve in the armed forces of the United States. Um, President Reagan, in his remarks at the Tomb of the Unknowns, said on Veterans Day in 1985, most of them were boys when they died, and they gave up two lives, the one they were, the, the one they were living and the one they would have uh, lived. Yes, we truly owe our forefathers, those who gave their lives for this country and for this Christ. And those who served our country and this Christ, we owe a debt of gratitude. You know, there's a, there's a, a, a fairly good-sized memorial in Washington, D.C. It is the uh, memorial that was built to uh, represent the soldiers of the Korean War. Does anybody know what's on that monument? Very, very famous say, freedom isn't free, is on the Korean War Memorial in Washington, D.C. Freedom from sin isn't free either. Jesus Christ shed his blood so that we could be free from sin. In fact, Art and I were talking about this before the service started. Is it 520? 521. 2 Corinthians 521 talks about what Christ did for us. And we can look back and we can see what soldiers of America did for us on the battlefield. So that's my presentation on Veterans Day, and uh, I, I, I want to give us a little bit of extra time, but uh, as I said, I've asked, uh, I've asked Ted to, before we break into prayer and uh, before Dick comes and uh, looks at uh, the uh, prayer prompter for tonight, Ted, if you'd remember those. <laughs> 